hypothesis test uh, for a mean whenever the population standard deviation is known. <clears throat> All right. So <clears throat> we touched on this a little bit in the last video, but uh, how do we find a p-value? Well, a p-value, uh, first of all, you determine whether or not the uh, the hypothesis test you're doing is a left tail, right tail, or a two tail test. And if you remember, we said that came from the HA, the alternative hypothesis. After that, we're going to ca calculate the test statistic, which is a z score for this situation. It's going to be x bar minus that mu null, that mu naught, if you want to call that, call it that, excuse me, over the uh, square root divided by the, uh, excuse me, <laughs> the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. All right, if the hypothesis test is a left-tailed area, then the p-value is going to be the area in the tail to the left of our test statistic. And that is what they're showing us here. Left-tailed test, the p-value is the area to the left of the test statistic. For right-tailed test, is the opposite situation. The area is now, the p-value is now the area to the right of the test uh, statistic. And then the last case is the two-tailed test. What you do is you're going to take both the negative and the positive version of your test uh, statistic, and you're going to calculate the area to the left of the negative uh, test statistic, and you're going to calculate the area to the right of the test uh, statistic, the positive version of it. And then that combined area gives you your two-tailed area. Enough with the talk, and let's get into some examples, maybe? Yes. A researcher is interested in testing the claim that a pain medication reduces pain on average in less than 21 minutes after taking the dosage. To test the claim, uh, the researcher collects the following data on a sample mean of 35 patients who took the pain medication and recorded the time for the medication to take effect. The researcher finds that the sample mean is 20 point, uh, 26 minutes. From past data, it is known that the population standard deviation is 3.5 minutes. Find the p-value for this hypothesis test and round your answer to three decimal places. Um, first and foremost, they left out a little bit of information here. I did not talk about this in the last video. But there are conditions that need to be met for hypothesis testing of the population mean. Okay, So the conditions are as follows. In fact, the conditions come from the central limit theorem. So if you remember uh, the last video, the last few videos about uh, confidence intervals. So look, you can do what's called a Z test. You can do a Z test if. So the central limit theorem says, if you don't know the status of your distribution, if you don't know the the distribution of your population, then either. You can uh, assume that the distribution is normal if your sample size is greater than or equal to 30. But if your sample size is not greater than or equal to 30, then you need a normal population. Okay, So these are the conditions necessary for what's known as a z-test. It's a hypothesis test for the population mean when... Um, the standard deviation is known. So you need either a sample size bigger than 30, or if you're smaller than 30, you need a normal population. Well, our sample size is 35, which is bigger than 30, so yes, we can conduct our um, hypothesis test. Okay, first step is to, let me go to a different color. First step is to come up with <clears throat> the hypotheses. So we are trying to test um, the claim that the pain medication reduces pain on average is less than 21 minutes. So the mean time is less than 21 minutes. So we are testing if the mean is less than 21. This is our claim, which is the alternative hypothesis. Okay. 
Otherwise, the other hypothesis, the null hypothesis in this case, will be, um, as we said in the last video, you can put a greater than or equal to 21 if you want there, but I'm going to put equals to 21. Okay. Okay, so the claim is the thing that we're testing, and we're testing to see, come on, we're testing to see if the mean is less than 21. All right, next step. We're trying to get the p-value. How do we get the p-value? Well, first of all, we need to calculate the test statistic. So here we go. I'm going to call this z-test. So our test statistic will be x bar minus mu null over the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Okay, so this is similar to the end of the last video. x bar, that is our sample mean. So they tell us that the sample mean is 20.26 minutes, so we're going to take 20.26, subtract away mu naught, which is uh, your hypothesized mean. This is the number that's in your hypothesis, which is 21. So we're going to take 20.26 minus 21, divided by our population standard deviation of 3.5 divided by our sample size, or the square root of our sample size, so it'll be the square root of 35, because remember there were 35 patients. All right, now we just have to go to our calculator, and let's get a z-score here. So let's see, let me pull up the calculator. Okay, so it's open parentheses, 20 point 26 minus 21, close parentheses, divided by, open parentheses, uh, what was the standard deviation? 3.5, I want to say, divided by the square root of 35. All right, close that denominator up, hit enter, and there we go to, uh, what do you want to do? Let's do three decimal places, why not? To three decimal places, our z-score is a negative 1.251. So this is a negative 1.251. Now, what is the p-value? What's the picture for the p-value? It is as follows. This is what a p-value is. If we have our normal distribution, I know I'm slanted a little bit, don't worry about that. Um, this is the standard normal distribution, so we're talking about z-scores. And a negative 1.251, remember we're centered right at uh, z equals zero. So let me actually do this. So if I remember our uh, discussion on the normal distribution right here is where z is equal to zero. So a z is of a negative 1.251 is somewhere over here. So let's call that z is a negative 1.251. Our p value will be the area either to the left or to the right of that negative 1.251. Well, how do I know which way to go? This goes back to the fact that this is a left tailed test. How do I know it's left tail? Because our HA is a less than. So the P value is going to be that shaded area right there. Okay. Well, how do we get that area? Well, if you remember from the lecture on um, how to calculate probabilities using normal CDF, this is what this is going to be. It's normal CDF. where, remember, we need four things for the normal CDF. We need a lower bound. Well, the lower bound for the z-scores here is negative infinity, which we're going to write as negative 1, E99. The upper bound is going to be that negative 1.251. Mean is 0, because it's the standard normal distribution. It's the center of the distribution. And the standard deviation is 1 for the z-distribution. So let's put that into our calculator. Second 
bars, normal CDF, lower bounds negative 1 E99, upper bounds the negative 1.251, mean is 0, standard deviation is 1. Let's put that on the home screen, let's hit enter. And there is our p-value. That is our area to the left of that z-score. To three decimal places, it's a 0 0.105. So that area is a 0 0.105. So our p-value is a 0 0.105. That is our p-value. A lot of work, spoiler alert. Uh, in the next video, we're going to figure out how to do this a lot more efficiently in the calculator. But right now, that's how you get your p-value. All right, so how do we make some conclusions and interpretations of what this p-value is telling us? Well, first of all, very important, your, I call this your decision rule. Your decision rule says this. If your p-value is less than or equal to your alpha, from the last video we know alpha is the level of significance, which is the probability of a type 1 error. If your p-value is smaller than your error, then you need to reject the null hypothesis. If that's not the case, then you're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. So either we're going to reject H null or we're not going to reject H null. So once you make your decision, now the last step is how do you make what I call interpretation, but here they're calling the conclusion, same deal. Well, this is how your conclusion is going to work out. Let's say your claim is a null hypothesis, okay? Let's say your claim is a null hypothesis. Well, if your claim is a null hypothesis, then your conclusion will be one of the following. Either you're going to say that there is enough evidence to reject the claim, or are you going to say that there is not enough evidence to reject the claim? So what's going on here is that, well, the whether or not you have enough evidence or not, that's based off of your decision, okay? If you reject the null hypothesis, that means that you have enough evidence. If you fail to reject, that means that there's not enough evidence. And just the easiest way to memorize that is, I always tell my class, the word fail. Key on that word fail. Anytime you fail something, that means there's not enough, right? When you fail an exam, there's not enough points. So if your decision has the word fail in it, that means there's not enough evidence. And because the claim is a null hypothesis, that's where this rejecting the claim part's going to come in. Okay. So rejecting the claim comes from the fact that you have a null hypothesis. The evidence comes from your decision of you either rejecting H null or failing to reject H null. What if instead your claim, the thing that you're testing, what if it's an alternative hypothesis? Well now, once again, you can have two possible interpretations in this uh, scenario. Either you say the conclusion is that there is enough evidence to support the claim or there is not enough evidence to support the claim. Once again, the difference between whether or not there's enough evidence or not enough evidence, or some may say insufficient evidence, is based off of your decision. Once again, anytime you see fail, that means not enough. So if your decision is to fail to reject, not enough evidence. But the difference between these conclusions and the conclusions uh, before is this keyword support. Well, now we're going to talk about supporting because our hypothesis is now, or excuse me, our claim is the alternative hypothesis. So basically putting this all together, there are four possible conclusions based off your scenario. Either you'll say there's enough evidence to reject the claim, or there is not enough evidence to reject the claim or there is enough evidence to support the claim, or there is not enough evidence to support the claim. Every hypothesis test will have one of those four conclusions, just one. All right. So let's go back to this. So this is the question we did earlier. 
So I'm just going to copy our work. So the researchers interested in testing the claim that a pain medication reduces the pain on average in less than 21 minutes. So that means that if you remember, our claim was that mu was less than 21. This was our claim. And our, that claim happens to be an alternative hypothesis. H null, on the other hand, was mu equals 21. Okay, if you want to refresh on that, just rewind this video about three minutes ago. All right, we did some work. We got a test statistic of a negative, uh, what was it? Uh, negative 1. Point, I think it was 251. Let me double check. What was our test statistic? Yes, it was a negative 1.251. And we got a p-value of a 0.105. All right, so here we go. What they want us to do is they want us to basically make a decision and come up with the interpretation for this test using a significance level of 5%. That is our alpha. Alpha for this is 5% or 0.05. Always convert your percents to decimals. Here we go. So what's the decision? What you do is you take your p-value, in our case is a 0 0.105, and you compare it to your alpha, which is a 0 0.05. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add an extra zero on my alpha there. It doesn't change the fact it's still a 0 0.05. But now it's easier to compare. 105 compared to 50. 105 is greater than 50, which means I'm in the case where my p-value is actually greater than alpha. But remember our decision rule. Our decision rule says if your p-value is less than or equal to alpha, you reject H null. Well, that is no longer the case. We have a p-value that's greater than alpha, so we don't reject H null. We're going to fail to reject H null. So our decision is that we should fail to reject the null hypothesis. That's the decision. What's the actual interpretation? Well, the interpretation is because we are failing to reject, because we're failing, there is not enough evidence to support the claim. I'm running out of space here, to support the claim. The reason why we're saying support the claim instead of rejecting the claim is because our claim happens to be an HA for this. There's not enough evidence because we are failing to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, last one really quickly. Uh, here they already did the work for us, but... Elizabeth claims to average that her average typing speed is at least 88 words per minute. From recent typing trials, it observed that Elizabeth has a sample typing speed of, of a mean of 96.9 words, <coughs> excuse me, based on 18 trials. Given the data below, decide whether we should reject or fail to reject a null hypothesis and come up with a conclusion regarding this claim. Here we go, folks. Um, they've already done the work for us, okay? So they've already went ahead and got their test statistic and used that to calculate the p-value. So they already did the work for us. So now all we have to do is take that p-value, which is 0 0.0262, and compare it to the alpha, the level of significance, which is a 0 0.01. I'm going to add a couple of zeros at the end. It does not change the fact that that's a 0.01. So you ask yourself, how does, basically, 262, how does that compare to 100? Well, it's greater than that. So once again, here we see that the p-value is greater than alpha, the level of significance. Well, in this scenario, that means we need to fail to reject the null hypothesis. So that is our decision. Why is that? What do we say? If the p-value is less than alpha, you uh, reject H null. 
If it's greater than alpha, that means you do the other thing, which is fail to reject. All right, because we are failing to reject, because we're failing, there is not enough evidence. Two, this time the claim was an H null. Remember, she's claiming that her speed is at least 88. So her claim is an H null. So there is not enough, enough evidence to reject the claim. Okay, once again, we're saying reject because the claim happens to be an H null. In the previous question, if you want to know the difference, the claim was an HA. That's why we said support in the previous example. Okay, see you folks in the next video.